On September 27, 2015, Peng Sun, a 22-year-old Chinese student studying in Vancouver, Canada, was invited to a party celebrating a friend's newborn baby. When he arrived at the house, his friend greeted him warmly and offered to show him around. But when Peng went down to the basement, his life took a tragic turn. Welcome to Red Eastern True Crime. If you enjoy this story, please subscribe to my channel. Let's dive into this story. Peng Sun was born in Beijing in 1993 and grew up under the loving care of his parents. He attended the best schools in Beijing. His father, Kang Sun, had a successful construction business that benefited from China's booming economy. During a trip abroad, both Mr. Sun and Peng fell in love with Vancouver because of its safety and convenience for Chinese residents. In 2008, when Peng was 15 years old, Mr. Sun sent him to study at a high school in Vancouver. Peng's mother also accompanied him to Vancouver for a few years. Peng later studied at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. During Peng's mother's time in Vancouver, she often drove a white Bentley for her daily errands. When she returned to China, Peng started driving the car himself. Peng was honest and courteous in his dealings. Unlike some other wealthy Chinese students studying abroad, he did not like to show off. Peng planned to return to Beijing after graduation in 2016 to work in his father's company and eventually take over the family business. In 2013, Peng and his girlfriend, Yang Qingqing, lived in a neighborhood in the city of Coquitlam in the Vancouver area. Soon after, a new neighbor moved into a house just a block away from Peng's. The neighbor was Tianyi Eddie Zhang, who was 21 at the time, a year older than Peng. Both were from China and shared a passion for cars, so they quickly became friends. Eddie Zhang was born in 1992 in Shuzhou, Shanxi Province. He told his friends that his father was a government official. In 2011, at the age of 19, Eddie Zhang began studying at Shanxi University of Finance and Economics. He often drove luxury cars on campus. Eddie later transferred to the University of Prince Edward Island in Canada. Unlike most international students, Eddie was already a permanent resident of Canada. He lived in Canada with his mother and younger brother and often traveled back and forth between China and Canada. Eddie was outgoing, loved to flaunt his lifestyle, and excelled at making friends quickly in new places. At first, Eddie Zhang often came to Ping's house to play video games. Whenever he was there, Eddie would receive phone calls from China, discussing topics such as companies, business, and finance, making him sound like a very successful businessman. This led people to believe that his family had a strong background and connections. One day, Eddie called Ping and said, I run an underground gambling operation and can offer you a high-paying job. Are you interested, buddy? Peng immediately declined, saying he wasn't interested. After seeing Eddie Zhang's behavior and conversations, Peng and his girlfriend Yang realized that Eddie was not being truthful. Eddie never mentioned which university he attended, and they discovered that the WeChat account he used to contact them was different from the one he used with their mutual friends. Peng later learned from his friends that Eddie had a habit of lying and exaggerating. He had told his friends in China that he could help them with legal procedures to come to Canada and had taken money from several people ranging from 6,000 to 10,000 Canadian dollars each. However, he was unsuccessful and he did not return the money to his friends. He then fled back to Vancouver. Peng began to distance himself from Eddie Zhang and shortly thereafter, Peng and Yang rented an apartment near the university. After moving out of their previous house, Peng removed Eddie Zhang as a friend on WeChat and cut off contact. In the summer of 2015, Peng had a surprise encounter with Eddie Zhang at a shopping mall in Vancouver. Eddie Zhang mentioned that he had recently gotten married and struck up a friendly conversation with Peng. He then asked Peng to add him as a WeChat friend again. After that, Eddie Zhang started asking Peng to hang out with him frequently. Peng didn't want to meet him and politely declined the invitations several times. Eddie Zhang knew that Peng did not want to stay in touch, but he continued to find excuses to reach out and invite Peng. 
This continued until September 27, 2015, when Eddie Jung contacted Peng again, claiming that he had just had a newborn baby and was about to have a celebration party that he insisted Peng attend to show his support. Feeling a little guilty after several refusals, Peng agreed this time and also bought a gift. Before Peng left, his girlfriend felt sick, so he called Eddie Jung and said he had to stay home to take care of Yang. Eddie Jung reacted strongly and offered to send a friend to pick Peng up, hoping he would still show up. He even mentioned that each guest would receive a new smartphone at the party. Feeling it would be rude to refuse, Peng decided to go alone. Around 6 p.m. on September 27, Peng drove his white Bentley to the address Eddie Jung had given him and was met by Eddie Jung in front of the house, which had been bought by Eddie Jung's uncle and had been empty since. Unknown to Peng, Eddie Jung's wife was only in her 39th week of pregnancy, and the baby had not yet been born. The celebration party was just an excuse to get Peng to show up. After getting out of the car, Peng gave Eddie Jung the gift and congratulated him, then followed him into the house. Eddie Jung offered to show Peng around the house. When Peng entered the basement, two people quickly overpowered him. They handcuffed his hands, tied his feet with zap straps, and pointed a taser gun at his head, threatening him to unlock his phone. At 8.30 p.m., Peng's phone made a call to his father. At that moment, it was 12.30 p.m. in Beijing on the 28th. Mr. Sun was in his office in Beijing when he answered the phone call. Peng's voice came through and said, Dad, I've been kidnapped. They have a gun to my head. This was followed by a calm young male voice in Mandarin demanding, I want 2.5 million Canadian dollars. Send the money now or you won't see him again. He then provided a Chinese bank account number and instructed Mr. Sun to send a screenshot of the transfer to Peng's WeChat. Feeling frightened and uncertain after the call, Mr. Sun couldn't confirm whether Peng had actually been kidnapped. Soon after, a second call came in, with the caller warning, Don't call the police. We just want the money. Follow my instructions and your son will be released unharmed. If you don't, he will be dead. Got it? Mr. Sun immediately told his wife about the situation, and after discussing it, they decided to prepare the ransom and call the police at the same time. The Beijing police suggested that he wait as long as possible and not rush the payment, and they also contacted the Vancouver police. Mr. Sun then told the kidnapper that it would take time to raise the money, and he couldn't raise the full 2.5 million Canadian dollars all at once. After a few hours, Mr. Sun made two separate wire transfers totaling 1.7 million RMB, approximately 340,000 Canadian dollars, to the designated bank account. After receiving the money, the kidnapper quickly called again to demand more. Mr. Sun and his wife anxiously waited for Vancouver police to locate the perpetrators, fearing for their son's safety. After half an hour passed with no photos showing their son injured, they felt a mixture of relief and continued anxiety. When the kidnapper called again, Mr. Sun noticed a change in tone. The caller was less aggressive and threatening. He even began to negotiate the ransom, eventually lowering it to 1 million Canadian dollars. Mr. Sun sensed the change in attitude and had a bad feeling. He insisted on speaking to Peng before sending any more money and wanted to hear Peng's voice. After some negotiation, the caller agreed. Soon after, a voice came on the line and said, Dad, please help me, give him the money. The kidnapper immediately took the phone. Mr. Sun knew his son's voice well and was sure that the voice he heard wasn't Peng's. He asked the kidnapper to let his son mention his sister's birthday, but the kidnapper refused, saying, don't trick me. Mr. Sun then suggested his own birthday, but the caller started talking about morality instead. Eventually, the caller provided a new bank account, 
and threatened to harm Peng if the money wasn't transferred. This time, Mr. Sun decided to stop sending money to the kidnapper. He finally contacted Peng's girlfriend, Yang, and sent her the recording of the kidnapping call. Yang immediately identified the voice as that of Eddie Zhang. With this information, Vancouver police tracked Eddie Zhang's phone and quickly located him. In the early morning hours of September 29th, at 3 a.m. local time in Canada, the police arrested Eddie Zhang and three Canadian accomplices on Lynn Valley Street in North Vancouver and found Peng's body in the trunk of a car. Peng's mother, sister, and brother-in-law rushed to Vancouver from Beijing. The brother-in-law saw Peng's body, which showed signs of a struggle before death. His face was twisted and purple, and his tongue was out, indicating that he had suffered before he died. The autopsy report later revealed that Peng died of suffocation caused by a zap strap around his neck. He died just seven hours after entering the house. Police immediately began investigating and questioning the four suspects, 23-year-old Eddie Zhang, 21-year-old Casey Hisko, 20-year-old Dylan Green, and 18-year-old Jacob Gorelick. Hisko worked as a poker dealer in Eddie Zhang's illegal gambling operation. He found out that Eddie Zhang was planning to kidnap wealthy people for ransom. So he introduced Eddie Zhang to a Canadian named Jay, and the two of them planned the kidnapping together. Eventually, Eddie Zhang chose Peng as their target. After Eddie Zhang lured Peng to the basement of the house, Jay and others held Peng captive with tasers, zap straps, and handcuffs. While Eddie Zhang called Peng's father, Hisko drove by Peng's apartment several times to check for police presence. When he didn't see any police cars, he texted Eddie and said, nothing, and we're good. At midnight of the kidnapping, Hisko found out that Peng was dead. Over about 45 minutes, he messaged Eddie Zhang several times on WeChat, detailing how to clean up and dispose of the evidence. When police learned from Peng's girlfriend that Eddie Zhang was the kidnapper, North Vancouver RCMP obtained an emergency warrant to listen in on him. The next morning at 9 a.m., police found Peng's Bentley parked near Sykes Road and Wellington Road in North Vancouver and set up surveillance. While some officers staked out the car, another group of police from Coquitlam, North Vancouver, West Vancouver, and Burnaby RCMP watched Eddie Zhang. Later, Eddie Zhang and Hisko texted each other to make a plan to move Peng's body from the trunk of his Bentley to the trunk of a car rented by Eddie Zhang and then dispose of the body. To facilitate the transfer, Hisko recruited two other Canadian men and told them they needed help moving a package. At around 3 a.m. on September 29, 2015, Hisko arrived at the Lynn Valley meetup point in a car registered in the name of Eddie Jang's mother-in-law. He had with him the two recruits, Dylan Green and Jacob Gorelick. Eddie Jang then showed up and backed up his rental car until it was trunk to trunk with the Bentley. The trunks of both cars were opened as they attempted to place Peng's body in the rental car. After waiting more than 10 hours, police swarmed the scene and arrested the four men. Peng was found wrapped in a tarp. He'd been stripped down to his underwear, his face wrapped in duct tape, and his hands and feet bound. Eddie Zhang said he left the basement for a few hours on the night of September 27th. When he returned early on the 28th, he found that Peng had been tasered unconscious by his accomplices. He quickly checked on Peng and realized that Peng was already dead. Eddie Zhang claimed that he did not tie the zap strap around Peng's neck, and Hisko also denied any involvement. The police investigation revealed that at least eight people were involved in Peng's kidnapping. Jay was identified as the organizer of the kidnapping scheme, which targeted wealthy individuals for ransom. He instructed Eddie Zhang to find young people from wealthy Chinese families. However, Jay was not arrested despite his involvement in the case. Three weeks before Peng was kidnapped, Eddie Zhang tricked a middle-aged Chinese man who worked in currency exchange. Eddie asked the man to bring 250,000 Canadian dollars to meet him. As the man got into Eddie's car, Hisko grabbed his face with both hands from the back seat. The man struggled and managed to break away. As a result, Eddie Zhang was charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, and indignity to a body. On March 11, 2016, 
police informed Peng's family that Eddie Zhang was likely to be charged with first-degree murder. Under further interrogation, Eddie Zhang chose to remain silent, refusing to answer any questions, and providing only limited information through his lawyer. Without a confession, police had difficulty gathering evidence from phone records and text messages, making it difficult to uncover the truth of the case and assess the impact of each criminal on Peng's death. What Peng's family found hard to accept, however, was that in February 2017, before the case went to trial, the prosecution cut a plea deal with Eddie Zhang. Eddie admitted to manslaughter, unlawful confinement, and extortion, but not to first-degree murder. The prosecution explained that in Canada, first-degree murder requires careful planning and an intent to kill. So unless they could prove that Eddie intended to harm Peng, when he organized the kidnapping, he could only be charged with manslaughter. The police concluded that Eddie Zhang did not physically harm Peng and did not want him to be killed. It was clearly Eddie's actions that made Peng a target for kidnapping. Under Canadian law, the maximum penalty for manslaughter is life imprisonment, but sentences typically range from four to 15 years in prison. On February 21, 2017, Eddie Zhang was sentenced to 14 years in prison by the Supreme Court of North Vancouver. Casey Hisco was sentenced to seven years. Charges against Dellen Green and Jacob Gorelick, who helped move the package, were dropped. The identities and whereabouts of four other suspects remain unknown. Of the $340,000 Canadian dollars ransom paid by Mr. Sun, only 50,000 Canadian dollars has been recovered. Police have not been able to trace where the rest of the money went. Due to the privacy concerns of the criminals, Eddie Zhang's personal information has never been made public. Peng's family has never met Eddie Zhang or any of his family members and has no idea about his background. They have only received some information about him from Eddie Zhang's friends. According to Eddie Zhang's official records in China, he is from Ying County in Shanxi Province, with only his own name listed and no details about his parents. At some point, someone gave Mr. Sun a name claiming to be Eddie Zhang's father. After checking, they found out that this person was an executive of a state-owned coal mining company in Shanxi. However, they couldn't confirm whether he was really Eddie Zhang's father. To this day, the identity of his family remains unknown. Media analysis suggests that Eddie Zhang, his mother and younger brother, settled in Vancouver. He was known to spend lavishly while his father remained in China. Such circumstances typically indicate a person of high social status, either in government or business. When Eddie Zhang was arrested, his wife was pregnant. She had posted on Weibo about the many gifts Eddie had given her, including luxury items from brands such as Hermes, Louis Vuitton, and Cartier. The police visited her after the incident, but she claimed to know nothing about the case. Later, Chinese media contacted her on Weibo, and she replied, I am not married to Eddie Zhang, before deleting all her information from social media. Her child was born 14 days after Eddie Zhang's arrest. The day before he was kidnapped, Peng had a video call with his parents. It was the mid-autumn festival in China, and the family was excited for Peng to graduate and come home the next year to celebrate. Unfortunately, that dream would never come true. Mr. Sun was deeply upset and frustrated by the sentencing of the criminals responsible for his son's death, especially Eddie Zhang, who orchestrated the kidnapping that resulted in the loss of life, but received only a 14-year sentence. Without parole, he could be out at 37, and Casey Hisco could be out already. Afterward, Mr. Sun, devastated by the immense grief and depression over the loss of his son, couldn't manage his business properly and eventually had to declare bankruptcy. Some people believe that Peng was kidnapped because he drove a Bentley, but Mr. Sun clarified that the car wasn't as expensive as those in China and was mainly for Peng's mother, who took care of him while he studied. Peng was not a show-off or a materialist. He was practical, safety conscious, and tried to avoid dishonest people. But he underestimated how evil people could be. What do you think about this case? 
please share your thoughts and opinions in the comments section. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel.